Welcome to the Daughters Project Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Join us this season as the sisters, along with Father Harrison Eyre, explore what it means to live with a sacramental worldview. You can find out more about our work at thedaughtersproject.com and on social media at Daughter St. Paul. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Daughters Project podcast. I am Sister Teresa Alethea, and I am back for this episode, and I'm here with Sister Nancy Elselman and Father Harrison Eyre. And today we're going to be talking about Mary, which is really exciting. Uh, You have a whole chapter in your book about the Marian stance, and I I actually really appreciated that because that was, um, I I thought that that's a really important point to make and kind of a pause in the book to to make. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, we're going to do our overheard in the convent. And this time I have a story, and if you guys have stories, you can totally share them after. But my story is one of our sisters had a dream about one of our founding sisters, one of our founding Italian sisters, Sister Concetta, and or we call her Sister Concetta. And she uh, she was in her dream, and the sister walked into the room, and this sister is an artist, so Sister Concetta had some of her props like all around her and in her hands, including a a silver white platter on her head. And sister, the sister said to her, what are you doing here? I thought you were dead. And sister Concetta kind of, kind of chuckles and she responds, oh, I was just taking a day off. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was so funny. That seems like such a a saint thing to say. Yeah. You know, just taking a day off. Just taking a day off. Yeah, it remind, actually reminds me of um, a, a saying from uh, Saint Teresa of Calcutta. She goes, "If I'm ever to be a saint, it's surely one of darkness that I will leave heaven and enter into the world to be a light in the darkness of the world." Mm, that's right? beautiful. Yeah. Sister Gonzaga was a real joker, though. She had she was serious in many ways, but she had this really wry sense of humor that just like you know she would do something quirky like that. <laughs> yeah, you hear I hear so many stories about her being so stern, but then you hear these other stories of her being a joker, and it's kind of a funny juxtaposition. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. But, yeah. That's fun. What was the reaction of the other sisters when they heard this story? They just like burst out laughing. <laughs> I think that's what makes people like that funnier because they're not usually funny or they come across right. very serious. But then when they're yeah. funny, they're really funny. <laughs> yeah, it, it's There is something unique to a table of sisters all laughing together at once. Yeah. It's something unique and, and joy filled and awesome to experience. <laughs> it is. It is. We know how to laugh about yeah. the simplest yeah. things. You better. You better. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys have anything you want to share before we jump into the content? Uh, oh. No. I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I have lots of stories about Mary and just the experience of her, but yeah, I think it'll come out as we talk along yeah. together. You know. Yeah, my life okay. is still kind of storyless. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so sad. <laughs> it kind of is. The, but that is like the, the situation of the pandemic makes our lives yeah. storyless. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm excited to talk about Mary. And I think I think you I really like the intro that you have to the section on Mary because you, you kind of admit that you didn't really feel like you struggled to pray the rosary. And I, I think a lot of people struggle struggle to pray the rosary. Um, and I think a lot of people struggle to have a relationship with Mary. So mm-hmm. I think it's a really important pause that you take in the book to address this because she's so crucial uh, to the sacramental worldview. And mm-hmm. you say, because of this connection we have with her through Christ, she shares her experiences of Christ with us so that we can know Christ more deeply and intimately. Mm-hmm. And um that I like that idea of knowing Christ through Mary, which is a very Catholic idea mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. other people can kind of bristle mm-hmm. at. But it's mm-hmm. so central to our faith. And I think mm-hmm. it's central because it's central because it's of the sacramental worldview. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? Or did you have any thoughts oh, as you read that intro, Sister Nancy? Oh, yes. I mean, I I, I think like everyone, we've probably we all struggled with this relationship with Mary at one point in our lives uh, from whatever our past experiences of mothers or of sisters or relationships. And 
And at one point in my life, yes, I, I was kind of shunning her, not because I intentionally did so, but I just couldn't get into that relationship with her. I was I was very focused on on Jesus, God the Father, and, the, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I was really involved in a very Trinitarian prayer. But I realized Mary is very much part of that experience of the Trinity. Uh, she received Christ inside of her, you know, physically and and gave birth through the Holy Spirit uh, to Christ. And at one point, uh, and a, a number of years ago already, I had this really profound experience of the rosary. And um, I went in and out of praying it. I mean, I pretty much prayed it most of my life. We prayed it as a family. So I, I've been praying the rosary forever, basically, all my life. But at one point I was realizing, yes, I, I was kind of getting stuck. Like Father had said in his book, you know, little rope prayers and just it was good becoming too rep uh, repetitive for me. But then I realized that this is Mary. As I'm praying, Mary is actually leading me to understanding what it what it means to live the life of the Christ, uh, to live the life of Christ, to live a Trinitarian life. And she's the one who shows me. And when I started praying again, I started praying from a very different view. And she, she be, almost became like, she's my sister, you know, having a cup of coffee. And we're praying and talking together. And it became a really profound moment in my prayer. Uh, and ever since then, the rosary has been my go-to <laughs> source of prayer to, to keep me grounded, to keep me mm -hmm. focused, uh, to keep me united. Mm -hmm. to Mary, to, to, to Jesus, to the, to the church, really, to keep me grounded even in my mission. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's the one through, I think, through her openness and receptivity, um, is constantly leading me, especially during this pandemic. She's been the one yeah. <laughs> who's kind yeah. of let me open to be accepting of what is happening. And that's beyond my control. Yeah. And I think she's the perfect example of that. Yeah. Yeah. The second Vatican Council is like, really, 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 really important to me. And, and I still loved how the council ends its chapter on teachings on the church with Mary. Mm -hmm. and, and the council calls Mary like the archetype of the church. This is a, a move in ecclesiology. Like that's what we call like the study of the church. Like ecclesia is the Greek for to be called out, right? This is the nature of the church is what the church is. It's ecclesia. It's so ecclesiology is the study of that. And uh, in the early church, this is how they always understood Mary. Mary's devotion to Mary was intimately tied to what the church is. It wasn't because I think, and I think it, it's kind of true a bit. This is something some theologians kind of criticized in some Marian devotion over the last few centuries was that it, when Mary got detached from the church and her mission and role with the church, she became, became almost like a, a pseudo deity almost like, and that's not really her mission and role. No, no, her mission and role is that we see what the church is meant to be in her, and not. Only, and then, if that's the case, then that that that's we also see what we're meant to be in her. She is the perfect response to Christ. None of us can say a perfect yes to Jesus. We are all fallen human beings, but because of her immaculate conception, she has no reservation in our heart. Sin does not reserve her heart in the yes to God, and so she says yes for us. Because we can't do it. And she draws us up into that yes. Like So like every time we we're asking her to pray for us, we're asking her, draw me into your yes to Christ because I can't give that perfectly. I need your yes. And, and But then it also kind of flips around too that we see in Christ what love is. That it doesn't hold on to itself, right? I love this. It's a bit of a technical word. <laughs> Sister Teresa told me to get it out of the manuscript which is fine, but I'm going to use it here in the podcast. <laughs> Expropriation, right? To make the property of another. That this is not my own property. I'm making this someone else's. Mary pondered all the mysteries of Christ's life in her heart. And the sword pierces her side out of love. So that what is in her heart and pondered is now made available to the whole church. She shows us in a very real way how to live the Christian faith, that we don't hold on to anything for ourselves, that we make it for others. And I, I you know, I wrote, I, cause I've always been a strong proponent that if you're going to talk about the church, you have to talk about Mary. But I, I wrote about it too, because I actually, I'm also a strong proponent that I think uh, something uh, Pope 
Benedict wrote once when he was Cardinal Ratzinger about Mary and the church that the church and the West in general is quoted, we call it like overly masculinized. We do, we plan, we, we concoct, but we don't receive, we're not open, we're not, we don't allow this kind of stance of receptivity. And he actually says, that's actually the fundamental human stance. And I think that's actually still a corrective. The church needs to hear of it. And so there is no better place to talk about this because, and she becomes kind of the centerpiece, if you will, of, of the book, because we go from like, what is this in like its theological sense to then how this is lived out in liturgy and prayer, et cetera. And so she becomes kind of the bridge of that whole worldview for us in a very concrete way. This is not an abstraction. This is someone who lives this and, and it, she's always active in our lives as mother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember something really kind of jumping out at me was when I realized that Jesus's genetic material is a hundred percent from Mary. Mm -hmm. So Mary's or Jesus's humanity is from Mary, hundred percent. And Mm -hmm. so for the sacramental worldview, like God used the material of the world in Mary to, to incarnate himself Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, so it makes sense that through Mary we'll participate Mm -hmm. in Christ and that participation in Christ is so central to the sacramental worldview. So I, I think that I think a lot, a lot about that for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I, and I do think it's because it's related to that sacramental worldview to, Mm -hmm. to God using the, the material of the world. Mm -hmm. And in Mm -hmm. in this sense, not just the material, but the, uh, the human person of Mary and her yes, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to incarnate himself in the world. And in a way, like Mary shows us how to be completely dependent on God, but God depended on her, on her yes, in a sense, to incarnate himself. And that's part of sacramentality, right? Is that God, God involves kind of the drama of human freedom in his plan. I mean, there's that great, uh, there's that great sermon by St. Bernard about the yes of Mary in the office of readings, right? That I just love about how the whole world's kind of hanging on pins and needles on her. Yes. And like Mm -hmm. even God himself, Without her, yes, Christ would never have been born. God is working through her, yes. He prepared her, yes, for this. But, I mean, uh, um, God's dep- God, if you will, dep- I'm putting this in air quotes. God mm-hmm. depends on this, right? <laughs> that, that God chooses to humble himself towards the world he wants to save. Mm-hmm. And that that act of humility towards Mary, and even a kind of reverence almost, right, towards yeah. who she is, is a prefigurement of the humility of God in Christ and coming into the world. And so, yes, God depends on her body. God mm-hmm. depends on her, yes. God depends on her whole being. Or sorry, I should say that Christ in God, right? Like Christ, mm-hmm. the Son of God, mm-hmm. depends on this. All of this to come into us and that he does this through it. And so it also then, but then it points us back to the church because like this is, if that's how Christ works through Mary, like that's how Christ works through the church, through our yes, through our freedom, through our kind of constant cooperation. Actually, this is um, it's at the end of Mark's gospel in the scene of the ascension, right? Where uh, it says that after Christ ascended, he worked with the church, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, so Mary is the first kind of concrete way that comes to fruition. She's it's the apostle. It's something real. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we celebrate Mary as queen of apostles, you know, because mm-hmm. she is there present in the the upper room with the apostles and guiding them and supporting them and praying with them and leading them to take on the mission of Christ to go forth and proclaim. So she is by nece- by necessity by and, and by actuality present at the beginning of the church, present at the beginning at, and is always with the church, always supporting and guiding and giving us the example of that saying yes to the Lord. And I love how you said, you know, the uh, the aspects of a Marian stance are receptivity, contemplation, and humility. And receptivity is such a difficult thing in our culture. It, it's hard to stop long enough to stop and reflect and think about and, and reflect. We just, we don't do that. It's, we're, like you said, we're do, do, do culture, you know, we're always out there acting. And that's very American. That's very, uh, North American, we just we just want to act, you know. Yeah. But Mary's response is so beautiful. I don't know if you've both read or any of our listeners have read Carol Hauslander's book, Read of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Read of God is so beautiful because it talks about 
Mary's virginal emptiness. And that's what allows her to be able to respond so freely, that yes to the Lord. And what uh, Carol Hauslander talks about, she says, Mary's like a reed. You know, and you think about a reed that's hollowed out and shaped and, and then pierced before it can become the piper's pipe, you know, mm-hmm. that can can sing a song, that can, you know, have a melodic tone. And and she says it it is the narrowest emptiness in the world, but the little reed utters infinite music. Mm-hmm. And that's Mary. Mm-hmm. She is that reed for us and for the church. Yeah. I love that book. And she she just explains Marian spirituality in such a visual way that I just mm-hmm. I, I really understood more about Mary from reading that book. Mm-hmm. I also think it, it really helps me to read women talking about Mary, because I think sometimes I, I feel like a um, Mary. I had a difficult time identifying with with Mary because sometimes I think that she's objectified in a way that is kind of um, makes her into something that is that she's not. So it's kind of almost like stereotypical feminine qualities rather than true feminine qualities, um, like submissive or meek or things like that. And I just did not identify with those qualities at all. So sometimes I think when when some women hear the word receptivity, they hear that a little bit. Some of those stereotypes can that can be found in the portrayal of Mary. Um, but I, but I like what Father Harrison said is that re- receptivity is something that we are call, all called to as human beings, mm-hmm. although it comes more m- more naturally to women. Um, but it's something that is uh, human, essentially mm-hmm. human, mm-hmm. but that we resist, male and female. We resist it also at a deep level because it, it requires um, us. A, 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 vulnerability really Mm -hmm. and humility yeah and humility to god and others and yeah you're right every time i write about especially like receptivity (laughs) i'm always like nervous because (laughs) it it, it's it's like a swear word today almost like it's like if and if you and if you talk about this as an enduring feminine quality like you're going to get you're going to get canceled yeah Mm -hmm. but it's because the way we understand receptivity is not like people like you're saying Mm -hmm. People see this as like a meek in the negative sense of the word, mm-hmm. not, the, yes. not the beatitude sense of the word, but like right. this meek, almost o- like overtly docile, like um, like a, a a walking mat that people can just walk over almost. Mm-hmm. But that's not re- like receptivity is actually the primary and active way we are to be human. Mm-hmm. It's essential. This is uh, and but it requires. A, like you were saying, a vulnerability, and, and like that says, I am not enough mm-hmm. <laughs> in myself. I need something more in my life to fill me. Mary, like Mary, experiences it. Like that that phrase you mentioned about like the void there. Her womb is the void. It's like it's very profound. She experiences that more than we ever could, mm-hmm. but she doesn't see it. You see, we see that as we we see that void, if you will, as as negative, as to be avoided. Um, Sorry, I just realized that was a pun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's to not be encountered. We we see kind of that that void as 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 a bad thing, right? That lack, right? That dependence. But Mary actually shows no. no it's actually the very place where where grace actually works. Um, actually, if I can read a quick quote mm-hmm. that just came to mind, if I can find it quickly, mm-hmm. it, it's from uh, Ratzinger. Mm-hmm. If I just because I this is my favorite quote from Ratzinger. And in some ways, this is the heart of everything we're actually talking about. Um, and he's talking about the apostolic office. So this is where we're kind of getting away. But this this gets to the back to the Marian point. He goes that Jesus says the son can do nothing of himself. And then he says to the disciples, without me, you can do nothing. And so he goes on to say this. Nothing that the disciples share with Jesus expresses at once the power and the impotence of the apostolic office on their own. By the force of their own understanding, knowledge, and will, they cannot, they cannot do anything they are meant to do as apostles. How could they possibly say, I forgive you your sins? How could they conceivably say, this is my body, or impose their hands and pronounce the words, 
receive the Holy Spirit. Nothing that makes up the activity of the apostles is the product of their own capabilities. But it is precisely in having nothing to call their own that their communion with Jesus consists. Having nothing of their own draws the apostles into the communion of mission with Christ. This service, in which we are made the entire property of another, this giving of what does not come from us, is called sacrament in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, Mary... I put this in massive air quotes because I mean this in a very poetic sense is a kind of primordial sacrament of the church Mm -hmm. because she lives that nothingness, that void, because only there can grace come in. I mean, we we always use that kind of um, analogy of like a jar filled with sand. It's like, well, there's no room for grace. You got to take the sand out for grace to work. But that's Mm -hmm. very true. But that's only possible when we are willing to say, I lack, I need. Mm -hmm. And only there can Christ say, okay, I want to speak to that. I want to enter into, I want to incarnate my life in you there. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that because that's, that's the other side of all this with Mary and the sacramental worldview. Christ, the Son of God, the eternal second person of the Trinity, the Word of God from all eternity, God from God, light from light, incarnates himself in her womb. Mm-hmm. And what is the church but Christ's body? And so... If Mary is the mother of the church, the church, in a way, is always in her womb, and Christ is always incarnating himself mm-hmm. into the church and into us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he, and that, this is not a poetic sense. This is actually something very real. This is what happens to us in baptism. There is a real, not just spiritual, but physical unity with Christ through baptism. And that's only possible because he takes on flesh in Mary. Mm-hmm. And so Mary's like, the linchpin of so much of this. Yeah, I think she, you know, sometimes we talk, like you said, Father, we talk about um, receptivity as being, or your sister, Aletha, you refer to as like a meekness, as a, as a negative thing, as a, it really as a weakness in women or in anyone in the church. Uh, but for Mary, it's actually her source of strength. It's what gives her strength. She's a strong woman because she can, be receptive to God because she can be open to the will of God in her life. And that, that doesn't take weakness. That takes strength to respond to that. Yes. And when she didn't know it and understand everything, but she, she believed so strongly that that was her strength. Uh, God worked through her. And I, I, I just think about that so often. It's like when people say that, you know, she was uh, a weak or that, you know, she can, she was just unique, you know, no one else could be like that. Yet, as we get older, when when we're younger, Father, we might be like, yeah, we want to be able to do, do, do and get everything Mm -hmm. done and we're going to be great and we're going to be well known and we're going to be, you know, Mm -hmm. famous or whatever. That's what a lot of people, when when you're young, that's what we think about, right? As you get older, you start realizing, well, I'm not going to be able to change the whole world and uh, it's not about me. Guess Mm -hmm. what? Um, I'm not in control. (laughs) And as we get older, we start realizing that more and more about that. And we start recognizing the gift that Mary is because she is a strong woman who is able to let go, to let God take over in her life. And yet it wasn't like a complete, you know, a, a passivity. It was an active yes. Yeah. And that's what you talk about. It's an active response to God. Uh, and that's why she is an example. That's why she is at the heart of the church. She leads us into living uh, a receptive, a contemplative, and a humble life. And that's the example of all the saints. Yeah, and I think you're I think you're touching on we I think we've talked a lot about Mary and receptivity, but I think we're beginning to start to touch on uh Marian contemplation, which which is something, Sister Nancy, that I've noticed, especially I learned from our older sisters in Boston. Um they they've entered into a time in their life where that is much more contemplative. And and it's so striking just when I talk to them how slow everything is and 
how I, even when I stop to talk to them, it's like a moment of peace in my day because they are such at peace and, and, and contemplative and really just kind of approaching life with such a Marian stance. I mean, they notice things that I don't notice too. You know, they go outside and they just talk to me about these new white flowers that they see everywhere that weren't there last year. And like they notice things in nature that I wouldn't notice. And um, that's that's like a Marian like it's like they have Marian glasses, uh, just seeing the world in its beauty and in its slowness and in, in a contemplative way. And it makes me think of um, Jacques Maritain. He has a preface to metaphysics. And in, in it, he talks about how in order to understand like to mystic metaphysics and and the scholastic metaphysics, you have to first enter into a contemplative stance and I think that that's related to the sacramental worldview because it's really about like seeing the world in the way that we're called to see it as Catholics, even if we don't get down to like the the academic aspects of, of metaphysics. It's really the same thing. We're seeing the world through through the correct glasses and it requires contemplation, which is so difficult for us today. So that's that's. That's hard. I, I'm sure people will read this section and just think, especially parents, you know, I just spent time <laughs> with my family and I just, God bless parents. They're so oh, busy. They're, they are just so busy. Every single moment of their day is responding to the neediness of their children. But, but also, I, I guess... I learned from children too because they naturally contemplate the world. So, mm -hmm. so that so I guess parents can learn from their children that Marian stance. I'm just kind of <laughs> yeah. I, I I was just I was just at a uh, some parishioners last night for like an outdoor barbecue and and great family, four kids, and their youngest just turned one. And and yeah, life is busy. They're like yeah, maybe we have a half hour at night to watch a TV show before we go to bed, and that's that's kind of life, right? But yeah, you see these attitudes of like this contemplation, kind of actually that a, a right attitude towards this is that it's it's mutually enriching, right? The child is naturally astonished at the world. And that's actually meant to be our, our, our stance, if you will. We're always really astonished, right? Mary's, Mary's response. How could this be? <laughs> it's not a, this is not a doubt. It's actually an astonishment. It's the wow towards the, the call. And that's, I mean, that's a child all the time. Right. Um, but then it was really beautiful to see, like we were talking a little bit about, how like children really teach us about our relationship with God. And, and the mom was like, yeah, I mean, like totally. Like I, I, I see over and over again how bold my children are with dangerous things because they have just no clue, but they're bold with it because they know mom and dad are there for them, right? Mm -hmm. And that, man, isn't that like supposed to be our relationship with God, right? Mm -hmm. And that that mutual nurturement's there. And that, that, but that was always Mary's heart. And that, that her, her heart of contemplation towards Jesus, like Jesus is the mediator of the Father. He makes that. So she, through Christ, she saw the Father. But then also for us in family life, for those, sorry, I should say those in family life, parents and children mediate that love to each other if we can learn to learn from each other and to slow down. And to, yes, life is busy. Yes, there are a billion activities. Although perhaps one of the challenging things towards that is Maybe we don't need so many activities, mm -hmm. right? I was just reading something about how, like, with regards to the pandemic, how it may, like, it was hard on adults. Adults like to complain about everything. But children, they're fine because they're in their natural state, which is with the family, mm -hmm. right? Because they have that stance of astonishment. And we just mm -hmm. lose that over time. And when Jesus has become like this child, like that's what we're supposed to go back to. And there is no better example of that constant astonishment and contemplative contemplation in Mary. It's why she's at the cross, right? And it's why John's there too, because John is kind of like the male contemplative stance at the mm -hmm. cross. This is the church in her fullness at the cross responding uh, in an openness to receive the, the blood and water that pours from his heart. But this is so important, I think, for families to pray to Mary together. Yeah. Um, my sister is a great example of this. Uh, she has six kids, and we there was a really traumatic moment in our life when we were all trying to travel to Rome to, for my brother's ordination. And, of course, he was being ordained near Christmas time, so it was like December 24th is the ordination day. And 
we were all set. We all have our flights. You know, there's about 12 of us ready to go to Rome for this great experience of family together. And, uh, well, it snows in London. And of course, all our flights are going through Heathrow and everything gets canceled and we can't get there. And because it's Christmas week, everything is packed and full. And I was supposed to go ahead of time, uh, like almost a few days ahead of everyone else. And I ended up in Puerto Rico for three days because I got diverted, sent to Puerto Rico, and they still couldn't get me to Rome. So I had to wait there. And my sister says she sent her husband to the airport because everything's canceled. So she got to the, uh, he went to the, you know, to all the different counters of the airlines and says, how can we get nine people to, to Rome? And they said, that's impossible. He went from one counter to the next and says, there's no, there's no flights. There's no seats anywhere. So my sister's like, I don't know what we're going to do. We're probably just not coming. And she calls me in Puerto Rico and says, I don't know if we can make it to Rome. Nancy, I don't know if this is going to happen. And I said, well, right then and there, I went into the chapel and I started praying to Mary. And I said, Mary, you have to get us there. And at the same time, my sister had all her kids. She just gathered them all together knelt down in front of a statue of Mary and says, we're praying a, a memorari novena. So nine memorias, let's start right now. We need to pray that we can make it to Rome for my brother's ordination. So she kneels all the little kids down. They start praying on the ninth memorari. Her husband calls her from the airport and says, do you want to go to Rome? And she's <laughs> like, what you got? She goes, I got nine tickets on a direct flight. She's like, wow. what? It was his so she calls probably. me in Puerto Rico and I said, that's great. I haven't made it there yet. I don't know how I'm going to get there. So I keep praying. She, she, it was a miracle. So she tells the kids and she says, see, see the value of your prayers. We mm -hmm. are going to Rome <laughs> in an impossible case here. <laughs> yeah. God wants to surprise us. Like this is my, one of my favorite stories to share, but we need to be in that stance of, oh, that Marian stance. And I, I, when I was on my retreat before being ordained a deacon, I was down in Louisiana and, uh, for, for my retreat. And uh, the priest gave me a meditation for that morning uh, about falling in love with God the Father. Like just like, and, and as I was doing my meditation, the image that kept on going into my mind was as if I was a two-year-old in the arms of his father, right? And it was just, it was a delightful time of prayer. It was beautiful. It was fun. And then at the end of the prayer, I was just in a, a time of delight and astonishment and receptivity, really. And, but then this is the beautiful thing. Only then does the heart get bold, right? This is what Jesus talks about when he says, ask the Father for anything and he will give it to you. It, that's the, Mary's heart is that place to start from. Otherwise, it just becomes like magical. I'm going, oh, I want a million dollars. No, that's not in touch with your desire. And there's this, this little point where I'm like, you know what, God? I'd love pizza for dinner. That's what I said. That's all. That was it. That was, that was my prayer. That was my little desire. Go on with the day, pray, other meditations, go for dinner. And it was just this little small place, and there was a priest and a couple brothers there, and the dinner was always in silence. And, and, and they come in with three pizza boxes. And I'm just eating with a massive, massive smile on my face. I'm just like, oh, this is the best thing ever. And so I go to meet with my director at the end of the day. He goes, why were you smiling so much for dinner? He goes, I'm, so I tell him this experience of my prayer. He goes, no, no, Harrison, you don't get it. We haven't had pizza in like three years. Someone just showed up at the door saying, I think you guys would like some pizza. <laughs> and like, but that's the thing. Like God wants to delight in us. In yes. God, God's, God's ways of delighting in me has always mm -hmm. seems to be through food. But, uh, <laughs> um, but it's like he wants to delight in us. But that to do that, our heart, and, and I mean, we lose it. Like I, I, I wish I could get back to that experience again. And I have mm -hmm. to, it's a work. If you, it is a work of being vulnerable and humble and open to Jesus but it's not something we can do on our own. We need Mary, and not just Mary, all the saints to intercede, teach, and give us their experience of Christ to draw us mm -hmm. into that life. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the beauty of this all. It's like it's a real participation. Mary is not this distant figure. She's someone who intimately participates in our life because she's part of that communion of the church. My, but one of my other favorite theologians, Hans Urs von Balthasar, talks about this relationship with Mary and all of this, and he says that that. It's not just a spiritual connection. It's even, if we can say it, a physical one. Mm -hmm. Because she's embodied in heaven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that maternal care. Like, so you have that emote. Like, so with Mary, then it shows us that the emotive side has a place in faith and actually a proper, like, you know, because we always say, oh, 
uh, faith is more important than feelings. It's like, well, no, actually, feelings are an important part of faith, right? Mm-hmm. That emotive side is important. Mar- the tearing of Mary's heart at the death of her son's important to experience and to go through. There is even a physical relationship both with Mary and Jesus because they're in uh, in heaven in their bodies is something mysteriously beautiful mm-hmm. and very nurturing to know, right? Because there is nothing more nurturing than when a child, I saw it last night, a uh, kid hit their head, they run to mom's arms and they're fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if that's not the life of faith, and not, and I don't mean that again in a poetic sense, but actually it's, it is, it's a real thing. You may not feel it physically sometimes, but there is a real physical connection because of the Eucharist that that's what binds it all. Then, man, like, that's so comforting <laughs> mm-hmm. to know about. It's actually comforting right now saying it. Like, sometimes these things just draw yourself to, I'm like, oh, right, this is true. I forgot about this. <laughs> and it brings it back to mind. I'm like, okay, this is going to inspire my prayer later, right? Because uh-huh. this is the beauty of Mary. I need to think about this more now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love that children have come up a lot in our discussion because I I don't think I've ever really connected the qualities of Mary to when Jesus says you must become like children. And so the childlikeness of Mary, and that's just making me think of how that kind of could help us to lead like a more joyful life in many ways Mm -hmm. because children are so joyful Um, but also children are humble and that's the last quality that you talk about and I I think all these qualities are pretty countercultural. like really if we if we live to embody these qualities we're going to be living in a way that is very otherworldly to people because to be receptive and contemplative and humble in this world seems strange to most people but I think especially humility. And you talk about um, humility and a stance towards the church's magisterium. And I think that's very difficult for people because I know some women who struggle with the role of women in the church, and they struggle with the idea that the magisterium is masculine, so they're all men, but they're called to have a Marian stance, if you if we recall like the quote that you just read from from Benedict. But I know I have a good friend who struggles with it, and, and she always gets kind of irritated when people say, well, but Mary is, you know, the everyone always points to Mary whenever she brings up the difficulty of the role of women in the church. And, and I, I do see how that can be difficult. So mm-hmm. how, could, how could Mary help women or anyone who struggles with the magisterium of the church, with the role of, of the male hierarchy in the church? How can she help us to understand that? Do you guys have any ideas about that? I really like the the idea that the magisterium is it's not it's the church authority, but it's not um, it, it's it's not the creators as Father talks about. It's not the creators of dogma or doctrine. I mean, it, it's not where they are the ones who are coming up with all these things that we and rules that we have to follow as Catholics. That's that's not what the magisterium is. That's not what the church authority is. The church authority, as Father speaks about, and you can talk about this a little bit more, Father, but is that it, it, it's a custodian of, of the deposit of faith that we have all received, you know, coming from Christ himself. And it's been this deposit of faith for 2,000 plus years, and we are receiving that. And I think it, by, being, by, uh, by being like Mary, we are seeing that as a gift from God directly. It is not just from hum, human beings to us. It's God's gift to us. And we are living this, this um, reception and uh, this receptivity towards this gift of God to us through the church. So I have a few things on this because in so in one and and for me the first one is I mean, there's obviously the, but this doesn't, I don't think this actually really convinces, but it's just worth saying anyways, is to say that we we often look at the church in terms of like a modern sense of power, right? To say, well, they're in leadership, therefore they have more power, they have more control over the life of the church. Isn't that sometimes true though? Like, oh yes, it is sometimes true. Absolutely. Um, but it's also like, sometimes it's like the church isn't this like monolith of power. The church's life is always concretely lived out most radically in our local parish community lives or whatever, right? That that's where it's really lived out. 
it's true. Yeah, the priest is the pastor of a parish, etc. So there is that element. Um, I think one element is always a, a healthy cooperation, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you talk to any priest, and they will tell you that their secretary or office manager, which are usually predominantly women, are mm-hmm. their right hand. Like I would not live or survive without my office staff. I would. I would be done. The parish would be in turmoil. Um, and but it's my job to consult. And to listen, right? I would be a bad priest, I think, if I didn't do that. And to hear, like, it's also like just to hear that other side of things. Like, I remember once we had someone request about baptism, and I was like really hesitant for a variety of reasons to do a baptism for this couple. And I talked to my office manager about it for for a few reasons, and I wanted to listen to her perspective because I didn't want to be stuck in. Well, these are the rules. This is what I think is important for the life of the church. And this is the vision I have for the parish. And actually, she agreed with me. But I, I, I wasn't going to be stuck in my own way of thinking about this. But I think that's always important. And I think that would become less of a concern if clergy would do that more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is a clericalism when a priest just acts on his own authority and doesn't consult or doesn't listen or anything. Mm-hmm. I wanted to start a couple of projects in my parish, but I'm talking to parish council and then I have to get finance committee approval before I even do anything. Like, mm-hmm. So in a way, I think it can start to be one remedy is that the priest himself lives out the Marian stance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Sure. Now, but that doesn't still answer the question because we still, again, but we're still kind of approaching it. I, I still think the question itself is problematic in a way. Because it's very mo- it's a very modern question, right? Mm-hmm. I want to be involved. I want to do. <laughs> women, mm-hmm. you know, there's only women only have value if they do more. And I'm like, well, no, 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 no. Like, I think the church can actually be a countersign to that and say, no, no. Actually, the Marian stance, which women live even more predominantly than men do, and 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 are a great sign to this, can actually. And you guys can correct me if I'm off base on any of this, um, but I think that if we can live that dignity and support and encourage it in the life of the church and say like, actually, this is the best way to be. Um, the church and especially women in the church can be a kind of counter sign to the world says, this is where w- female dignity is found. And then for me, it's always, I'm going to toot the horn of religious sisters here because I think, and you talk to any priest, like a, I always say every priest should have female religious friends. Mm hmm. <laughs> Because we need that complementarity. Mm-hmm. We all yeah. need it, right? We both mm-hmm. need it. Um, yes. Without complementarity, like, that's when people get weird. Um, <laughs> right? But, like, I still remember when we went to Notre Dame Sister Teresa. And we were just, it was the first day there. I think it was our first full day there before the conference or whatever. We're walking around. We're talking. We're just checking out the university. And you're like, well, before we go do our talk, I think I'm going to go pray. And it was a good reminder to Father Anthony and I that we need to do the same thing. And I was really grateful for that. And it was not in like a, maybe a, it wasn't in the, you have to go pray too. It was, but just your example encouraged me to remind me, oh yeah, I got to do this, right? And I, I gave a talk once to the missionaries of charity. And I said, you're concrete Marys mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. And I think if the church can find ways to live that out and to embolden that and to put that on a pedestal, mm-hmm. I think a lot of those concerns will start because none of you, I mean, a first, I will say from the experience of a pastor, nobody should want this. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You don't seek this out for your own glory. Trust me. (laughs) It's not glorious at all. Uh But, um, but at the same time, it's not the the clergy shouldn't, because I think that's part of it is I think there was a culture at one time where sisters were essentially seen as the servants of the clergy. Right, and that's not okay either. Or yeah. in the laity, were to pray, pay, and obey, mm-hmm. and that's not okay. Like it's mm-hmm. the church is a communion, right? And if it's a communion, there's different members with different roles and missions, but it's all done to encourage and lift each other up. I can't do what religious sisters do because right. I'm a man, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. You can't do what priests do because you're a woman, and that's okay. But if we live that out in a complementarity rather than in a competition, mm-hmm. man, the church could do so much good. Sorry, I rambled on long that time there. Mm-hmm. And the church does do so much good. It yeah. does because of yeah. all these people, and especially contemplatives, contemplative men and women uh, yeah. in monasteries that people don't see. Uh, yeah. They are a powerhouse in the church. Mother Teresa would say for her, because she has a, they have a contemplative branch of missionaries mm-hmm. of charity. And she says they're the backbone of the order. They, mm-hmm. We have a contemplative they, they branch. They said we, we yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, I do think the modern situation, there's a lot of negative things said about the modern situation in terms of, right. of women, but I actually think the emancipation of women and the rights of women have um, allowed allowed us to kind of explore that complementarity mm -hmm. more. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes when people respond to uh, concerns of people about the role of women in the church, we can tend to idealize like the magisterium and idealize Mary instead of talking about mm -hmm. the reality of the of the situation, even though we know mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit works within the reality of of our human mess. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think the Marian uh, stance of the church can be improved as more and more women kind of step into their role of of being uh, an apostle to the apostles, of being uh, um, kind of that that voice, that strong voice of, of femininity that we are called to be a, as women um, to kind of. It, it doesn't mean that we're going to be the magisterium, but that we mm -hmm. can kind of uh, have more of a of a voice in 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 mm -hmm. the interpretation, especially of the of the magisterium's teachings, because mm -hmm. I think I think that that is what causes more of a problem more so to me than than the, mm -hmm. the magisterium's yeah. teachings. But sometimes the way that they're interpreted, if, if there isn't a feminine voice in there, there can be some major things lost there. So I think there's so much room for growth in this area of this Marian stance. And it's and it is growing. Like I know like one of uh, my favorite kind of contemporary scholars is Tracy Rowland. She's on the International uh, Commission for Doctrine, right? She's um, oh, I'm forgetting her name. <sighs> But there's a sister, a religious sister. She teaches in New York, who who actually had kind of had a conversion in learning about the church's teaching on reserving ordination to men only. Um, sister Sarah Butt. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, she, Sarah, she, she writes. Yeah. She wrote a book for us or compiled a book called "Women, Sex, and the Church." Um, cool. Yeah. If She's so interested. good, right? And yeah. it, but it's beautiful that it was something worked through, right? And so now she understands the other side because she was there at one point, right? Um, and it's something that the church really ought to to always encourage because uh, um, and then there are many prominent ones and it's just about allowing them to have a voice and it's important that yes absolutely like they ought like they, they ought to be like in the end it is going to be the mission and role of of bishops to declare doctrine when they're called upon to do it which is actually that's the other thing it doesn't actually happen that often mm -hmm. yeah. usually conciliar and that's ordinary magist like the ordinary magisterial ways is kind of the normal way but like even the pope has has consultors and stuff who aren't who 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 are women and and, mm -hmm. and you need that perspective and that stance and I, I i completely agree with that that um because i think especially especially clergy they need the check to say shut up and listen mm -hmm. <laughs> right and i think women have a have lived that live that receptivity and that humility in such a powerful way in such a I think a, a life giving way and actually I think it's the more natural way in general that we as men need to learn from that mm -hmm. and I, I agree with you I think you're right that whether modernity's interpretation of what women is 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 not right you're right that it has um, opened up the ability to have a deeper discussion about what complementarity looks like. I think, mm -hmm. unfortunately, still, even that, that word complementary is often used in a one-sided sense to dismiss the feminine perspective mm -hmm. in all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Complementarity means equality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's Trinitarian in nature, which means one is not greater than the other or anything like that. And there is no subservience in complementarity. Mm -hmm. There's humility. There is expropriation. There is... Um, self-sacrifice there is willing to put oneself lower than the other in, in an active humility but that has to be both sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and and it's why i wanted to do a chapter on mary because i thought this is so important to talk about today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we need to start poking around to say no no we got to actually be more feminine as a church which in some circles would be a be really weird in, here to in think. a derisive way which i find because it, oh, it often is <laughs> yeah. right yeah. yeah yes yeah they talk about the effeminacy of the clergy or whatever yeah. or, or whatever and it's like wait so is it bad to be a woman yeah it's very or offensive. or it's it's um it's it's used in a you know we need more real men in the church mm -hmm. and like the realest men are marrying at their core 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means they're slow they're receptive their heart Mm -hmm. is open like i I think like actually honestly i think of the great a great example of a person like that is saint john paul ii Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. oh yeah right like his hours in prayer in the morning Mm -hmm. in front of the tabernacle Mm -hmm. that was formed from his relationship his his relationship with mary and he Mm -hmm. was able to be authentically human in that because i think in the end we're authentically man and woman when we allow what is true of masculinity and femininity to both be true in us yes. in a male way and a feminine way. Absolutely. But mm-hmm. that we don't see these things in competition, but like, like women are a gift. Men are mm-hmm. a gift. We are gifts to each other. We're not in competition with each other. Yeah. Like that whole contemplative. Con, uh, I think that's the, that's the framework we got to remove is that competitive framework mm-hmm. and say, no, no, we're there to be a gift to each other, to learn from each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm grateful for that. Like I am grateful to have all these Pauline sisters as friends. Mm-hmm. And I learn from that. Yeah. I really do. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I, I would not be able to be a half decent priest without that. Mm-hmm. I hope that answers your question. I, I, <laughs> no, I, get talking. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> this will be a helpful discussion to a lot of people. So I'm really mm-hmm. grateful that you guys are willing to go there. Um, so I do recognize a bit of the irony of like, you're asking this question about how can women be more there and then I'm t- doing too much talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Father. <laughs> that, I know that's, I man- that's I man- not I your masculinity. That's more your your high extroversion. <laughs> it's, it's it's actually probably the extroversion more than anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought this time you, I usually pick a prayer for one of our prayer books, but you have a beautiful prayer at the end of of this chapter mm-hmm. that that I thought we could close with. So, sure. Um, Mary, my mother and mother of the church, give me your heart to see as you see. Help me to encounter the mysteries of Christ's life through your eyes. Help me to see the church and the world through your eyes. Open to me the secret recesses of your heart so that I may know your son. Give me a heart like yours, receptive, always pondering, completely charitable. Draw me close to your son and help me to find the truth that has been with me since baptism. I am a member of Christ's body, and therefore I am in Christ. Dearest Mother, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus. Make Make us us saints. saints. Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus. Make Make us saints. saints. Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus. Make Make us us saints. saints. All right. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next week. God bless. God bless. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is a fruit of the Daughters Project. This initiative of the Daughters of St. Paul to spread the gospel online is made possible by our generous Patreon supporters. Consider joining us in our mission by contributing to Patreon today. You can find us at thedaughtersproject.com and on social media at Daughter S.T. Paul. God bless you.